welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Uh, Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We need to understand what it means when God says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, testifies with our spirits. We need to understand what that testimony of our spirits really means. And if you turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who, is, who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Amen. Are you born again? Yes. Now, in order to understand these scriptures, we need to understand the nature of God's love for us. And this isn't something that you don't know, but it's something that you need to be reminded of so you can receive what God is saying through these other scriptures that we've just quoted. If God in his love has come to live in you, he surely knows everything about you. And nothing can be hidden from him. Jesus says that God even knows the number of hairs that are on our head. That always, to me, seems to be probably the least significant thing about us. Uh, And yet if God knows such a detail as that, then he surely knows everything else. So there is no way in which there is anything about ourselves that can be kept from him or hidden from him. He knows everything about us. He sees everything that goes on in our lives, not just the things we do, but even what is going on within us. And of course, what it says in Psalm 139 helps us to understand the nature of this tremendous love. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. Have you experienced something of the searching of the Lord in recent weeks? He's been searching you because he knows you now. The purpose of God in searching us is not to discover things about us because he already knows them. But when he searches us, it's to show you what he knows about yourself. Because you don't know yourself as well as he knows you. So one of the secrets of really being able to meet with God in the way that he desires is for us to know ourselves. And so you have been going through a process where God has been introducing yourself to yourself. And in the process, you probably discovered a certain number of things about yourself which you haven't liked. And you can be quite sure that if you don't like them, God certainly doesn't like them either. And, of course, he does this not to make us feel bad, but in order to set us free and deliver us from those things about ourselves that he doesn't like. So David says here, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. 
He knows every movement that you make. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Now, this is David talking. He was not filled with the Holy Spirit in the way that you have been. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. But if God could know your thoughts from afar, how much more would he know your thoughts from within? If he lives within you. Now that means you cannot have a thought that can be hidden from God. You've only got to think, I don't want to go to the meeting this morning, and he knows you've thought that. And he knows not only that you thought it, but he knows what is going on in your heart that lies behind the thought. Uh, You've only got to think, I don't feel like praying, and he knows that you don't feel like praying. He knows the thought, he heard the thought, and again he knows whatever lies behind that. Why you don't feel like praying. Is it because you're focused on yourself rather than him and what you want to do or you've been tired because you haven't been stewarding your time in the proper way or whatever? Uh, But he knows. And once you've had a thought, you can't take it back. You can't say, oh God, I didn't really think that. He says, yes, you did. I heard the thought. So you have to learn that as soon as you've had a thought that is negative, that is wrong in any way whatsoever, to immediately ask God's forgiveness there and then. Uh, Don't even delay a second. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Sorry that I even thought that. And it may be that you need to say, just cleanse my heart afresh so that I don't continue in that negative or ungodly or whatever it is just a critical thought. He knew it. It's not just a question of, well, Lord, I I kept my critical thoughts to myself. I didn't speak any judgment against my brother. He said, I heard the thought. And you see, this is why Jesus says, when you look upon a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Why? Because he knows the thought. He sees the desire that the thought gives rise to within the person. Nothing can be hidden from him. Now, this isn't because he relates to us as a judge, but because he loves us so much, he is concerned not only about every hair on your head, but every thought that you have. You discern my going out and my lying down. He knows when you're sleeping on the job instead of getting on with the job. Hello? He knows when you decide to lie in instead of get up and pray. He knows the motives behind that. And if you know anything about God, excuses count for nothing with God. There are no excuses. So, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. All my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. Why? Because from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he knows what you're going to say even before you've said it. He sees what is forming in your heart and because he knows the end from the beginning, he knows what you will say. The negative word, the word of judgment, criticism or whatever, he knows. And all this seems somewhat of a contradiction to the one that is born again will not continue to sin. So we've got to understand what's going on here. 
because you told me just now you were born again. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Nothing, nothing, nothing is hidden from him. And then David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. You see, what what David realizes is God knows me so intimately, so completely, I can't hide a thought, I can't do anything, I can't stand up without him knowing, I can't lie down without him knowing, I can't go out without him knowing, I can't come in without him knowing. I can't have a thought without him knowing. I can't have an attitude without him knowing. I can't have a desire without him knowing. Such love is too wonderful for me to understand. He doesn't see it as a threat. He sees it as a realization of just how completely and how fully God loves me, how fully and completely he knows me. He must, he must love me even more than my wife loves me to love me like that. Or anybody else could ever love me. Nobody knows about me what he knows. Nobody can see what he sees. And yet, as he looks upon me, as he looks upon you, it is in love, not in judgment. So it isn't that he's seeking out everything that is wrong in order to condemn. But of course, anything that is not of him does not belong in one who is born again. So let us come then in the light of this tremendous love that God has for us, knowing everything about us, to this scripture in Romans 8, verse 16, that (coughs) the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. Now, we know that each of us has a human spirit and that 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 human spirit that was to all intents and purposes dead, it was like in a coma until we were born again, until the spirit of God came to live in us. And at that point, your human spirit was brought to life. And that happened because the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit and we know that his purpose is therefore to impact our soul life and therefore our bodies and our actions with the life of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Now, Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. He would take the things of Jesus and declare them to us. So, if the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, you have this ability to know the witness of the Holy Spirit. And actually, the way the Holy Spirit communicates is to your spirit. Uh, So that uh, you can hear and know the voice of God to you at any given time. The Holy Spirit is there to speak to your spirit and will be all day long. Of course... If we allow the soul to rise against the spirit, we kind of suppress the voice of the spirit and are not sensitive to what he's saying because we are so taken up with our own thoughts and our own activities and what we're doing in our own soulishness. 
Now, of course, the one who is born again won't live like that. So the scripture says. Now, I want you to understand that what God is doing amongst us is not unusual or extraordinary as far as he is concerned. We can use words like revival and restoration and all and, and reformation. But as far as God is concerned, all that is, he is doing at this present time is working in our lives so that we live the gospel. Everything that he's saying and everything that he's doing is to enable us to live the new life that he has given us by the Spirit. So this isn't anything unusual to God. This is normal. And even the way in which we are praying and seeking him should be the norm. It should be possible to go into any church on a Sunday and see people meeting with God in the way that we are beginning to meet with him. That is God's purpose. God isn't interested in services. God is only interested in his people encountering and meeting with him so that then they do not sin. We'll come to that later. You must understand that God is not a fan of church services. That, that uh, what he desires is the fellowship that his children are to have with him. The fellowship with the Father and the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the coming together of God's people is to express that fellowship. And you can't express fellowship in a form. You can't formulate a, a kind of a form of service and say, in that you have the fellowship. The form has to go and to be subservient to the fellowship with the Father and the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. So what we're experiencing here is the normal form that we've had of eight o'clock says now gone, it's lost. Because what God is concerned about is that we have fellowship with him. Amen. Now, if, as must be the case, this scripture is true, because all scripture is true, that the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs and co-heirs with Christ. How does this work? What does this mean? Well, <clears throat> let me put a question to you. In your spirit, do you believe that you are a child of God? Three of you are the children of God. Well, I suppose that's better than none. But that's a question for all of you. Do you really believe, do you have the witness within yourself that you're a child of God? Yes. Okay. Now, how, why is that the case? That is because the Spirit of God has borne witness to you that you are a child of God. Therefore, you believe you are a child of God. And you believe you're a child of God because you've heard. You see, you've heard the Lord. Faith comes from hearing. And you may not have heard a visible, uh, an audible voice saying, you are a child of God. But the Holy Spirit has spoken to your spirit and he bears witness within you that you are a child of God. Amen? So you believe yourself to be a child of God. You know yourself to be a child of God. Nobody has to come along and convince you that you're a child of God. You know it on the inside because it's revelation that you have received from the Spirit. Amen? 
Amen. So, <clears throat> let me ask you another question. Jesus says, Be merciful, for your Father in heaven is merciful. Now, do you have a witness in your spirit that you are as merciful as God is? If not, why not? Because, you see, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, takes the things of Jesus, takes the words of Jesus and declares them to us. So, something is amiss If the Holy One has come to live in us and we don't have the witness that we're like him, let me put this another way for you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has forgiven all your sins? Why do you believe that? You believe it because the word of God says it. If the word of God did not tell you that when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins, if the word of God did not declare to you what Jesus has accomplished through the shedding of his blood, you could not believe that he had forgiven all your sins. So, there is a sense in which, a general sense in which you believe that Jesus Christ forgives all your sins because the Holy Spirit has witnessed those scriptures to your spirit. But now, can you stand before God today and say, at this moment, Lord, I stand sinless and blameless before you? Can you, can you say, today, at this moment, I stand before you holy and blameless? Now, this is why we've got to be careful. Because we know that that is scripture. But what God is looking for is not the knowledge of the scripture, but the outworking of the scripture. So you see, you only have the witness in your spirit of what you do, not of what you know. So you see, if the Holy Spirit bears witness to your spirit, Yes, he he gives you that, if you like, the general information from the Word of God that you are holy and he's called you to be holy and blameless in his sight. But when you have that witness in your spirit, you know you stand holy and blameless before him now because there is nothing in your life of which you are ashamed nothing in your life that has not been forgiven, no sin that has not been atoned for and yielded up to him for his forgiveness. You are pure. Are we there? So God wants to bring you to a place where you have this witness in your spirit that I am merciful even as he is merciful I am holy even as he is holy because Christ is my holiness 
and I can stand blameless before him. Now, you see, if we really have that witness, not as head knowledge, but the witness in our spirit, it's going to make all the difference to our praying. Why? Because our hearts will not condemn us. And if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So let me ask you another question. Do you have that witness in your spirit that you love your brother as Christ loves you? Can the Holy Spirit bear witness to your spirit that you actually fulfill that command that Jesus gives? You are to love one another as I have loved you. You see, we know the command. We believe the command. But what God is concerned about as he looks upon us, knows our thoughts, knows our attitudes, knows when we stand up and sit down, go out and come in, and knows the words that are going to be upon our lips even before we speak them, does he perceive that love in your heart and in your life that you love your brother as he has loved you? Because the one that is born again will not sin. And not to obey the command would be sin. Are you enjoying this? Well, you shouldn't be. (laughs) Now, you see, this puts us, or puts everything that goes on in our lives in a right perspective. What is God about in these days? What is he doing in our lives? Well, he's bringing us to the place where we don't simply have the witness that the word is true, but we have the witness in our spirit that we are living that which he has called us to live. Completely, solely, by his grace. that it is nothing of ourselves, but it is wholly and purely and completely of him. Now, how can that be? How can that work in practice? It can only work in practice in as much as we have yielded and given and continue to give day by day of ourselves in surrender to him. It can only happen in as much as the Holy Spirit is continuing to breathe his life into us every day. It is not enough to say, I have received the Holy Spirit, but the fellowship of the Holy Spirit means that he is breathing his life into you afresh every day of your life, and you are receiving from him and living in the good of what he is doing so that by his enabling you can fulfill the word of God and do what pleases him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So, we can't avoid these scriptures much as many a believer has tried to John, who knew Jesus so well, says in uh, chapter 3, verse 9 of his first epistle, no one who is born of God will sin, or the NIV says will continue to sin. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, let us be very clear. I mean, you hear me say again and again, everything depends upon people being birthed properly. 
Let's understand that somebody making an act of commitment is not being born again. That is not the new birth. You only know a person is born again when there is a complete transformation in his life, that the old has gone and the new has come, and that he is in no way the same person that he was before. Then you know a second birth has taken place. But to say, you know, you lead an addict to the Lord and he is still an addict, he has not been born again. The new birth has not taken place. There is not that transformation of life. When there is, the addict immediately ceases to be an addict because that's what he was, but it's not what he now is. Now, that's perhaps a, a quite a dramatic uh, example to take, but the same principle is true of every person that is born again. And if he is born again, all his sin has been forgiven. The temple of his body, if you like, has been cleansed of all sin and made holy in the sight of God, and God now comes to inhabit the temple. And, of course, his purpose is for the temple to be filled with his presence. Now... There are people that want to try to change the word of God and say, well, if someone is born again, he doesn't sin habitually. But that's not what the scripture says. It says the one that is born again does not sin and does not continue to sin. He does not live in sin. He does not walk in sin. Now, this would seem to be a big contradiction to experience. Or let me put it the other way around the experience of believers seems to be a big contradiction to this scripture. And yet, this is the word of God. And John, who is preaching it, knows it's the word of God. I've told you about a season that we had some years ago in Kingdom Faith where actually, I believe, we, we lived this, that we lost all desire to sin uh, And that's the problem, you know, when we desire to sin, that's when we don't walk in the goodness of God. Uh, It was a a time of tremendous holiness that God is bringing us back to. He is restoring us. But we need to understand that this is not simply experiencing God in his holiness, but God working something in us that is supposed to be present in every believer on the face of the earth. Sadly, you see, it is the experience of most, if not all Christians, that although they're born again, they do sin. So something is not right in the purposes of God, if that is true. We're missing something. that it must be possible for God to work in us in such a way that we come to that place where we will not sin. Let me uh, read something from our dear friend Wesley. The key in that verse that we read at the beginning, he that is born again will not continue to sin because he who is born of God keeps himself. Keeps himself. By the one that is born again in you, the Holy Spirit, you keep yourself. Now, what does John mean? What's he getting at? He's referring back to what he heard Jesus say at the Last Supper. 
Go on living in me, and I will continue to live in you. You see, how can anyone who's living in Jesus sin? Because in Jesus there is no sin. Are you with me? Now, you can be in Jesus in the sense that God has put us into Christ, but you can't live in him and sin. So Jesus says, if you continue in my love, you will obey my commands. In other words, you won't sin, you will be obedient. Are we getting this? So, how how can that be in our lives? Well, it can only be if, having received the Lord, we live such a devoted, surrendered life to Him that our, our lives are filled day by day with love for Him, loving Him with all our hearts, loving others as he has loved us, that our lives are filled with praise, they're filled with thanksgiving, that we're rejoicing in him. You see, let me, let me put it this way. It's very, this is very simple. This is pragmatic. This is practical. While you're rejoicing in the Lord, you will not sin. While you're praising the Lord, you will not sin. While you're praying to the Lord, you will not sin. While you're trusting in the Lord, you will not sin. Where you are meeting with God, you will not sin. How does sin enter into the lives of those that are born again by them not doing what the Lord says in his word? Give thanks in all circumstances, pray continually, rejoice always, because if you do those three things, you will not sin. You cannot sin while you're doing those things. While you're giving thanks to God, you cannot sin. While you're rejoicing in Him, you cannot sin. While you're trusting in Him, you will not sin. While you're praising Him, you will not sin. While you're praying, you will not sin. Are we getting it? So... What John is saying is you keep, while you keep yourselves in the purpose of God, you will not sin. And God's purpose is, you see, to take us out of sin, that what the cross means, and this is why what you see in someone who is genuinely born again, he is not only forgiven of his sins, which is what happens when he's justified, but he is delivered from the power of sin, which is what God works in him through his new birth. So justification and new birth are related to one another, but they're not the same thing. Justification is what God does for you. New birth is what he does in you. The justification makes you acceptable to God, but the new birth gives you a transformation of life. And those are two different things. Are we getting this? But, of course, sin is always crouching at the door. The temptation of the devil is all around us, all the time, every, every day, wanting to lead us out of this life in the Spirit into the soulishness where we depend upon ourselves and look at ourselves and take our eyes off Jesus, even though we know the Scripture says, fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith. Now you see what uh, our friend, our brother Wesley says, that while you continue in these spiritual purposes that God has given us, what he calls the means of grace, while you persist in the means of grace, day by day in your life, you will not sin.
And those, those means of grace are really being giving ourselves over to God in prayer, in his word, and, and through Holy Communion. He's, you know, which is interesting, somebody like Wesley saying, these are the three means of grace that God has given us that day by day we may keep our whole being fixed on him. Now, of course, you know, he lived in the real world like we live in the real world. But if we are strong in the things of the Spirit, when we encounter the world, we will have victory over the world. What is it that has overcome the world? Even our faith. But it isn't that when you have a temptation that you try to overcome it, but if you're living in that overcoming life of Jesus, when the temptation comes, you will overcome it. You will not yield to it. Whether it's a temptation, you know, to be critical, whether it's a temptation to give room to wrong negative thinking, whether it's temptation to say something that's not right or do something that's not right, you will conquer the temptation. There's no sin in being tempted. Jesus was tempted. But he always overcame the temptation. Now, how is it that, that people that are clearly born again, that have experienced a transformation of life, that the Holy Spirit of God lives in them, if they are living and working in, walking in the Lord in the way that he desires, how is it then that sin can get in? And Wesley, in one of his sermons, he, he quotes some uh, spiritual, some biblical examples of, like Peter when he sinned by uh, eating or, or refusing to eat with the Gentile believers because he was afraid of the Judaizers. That's just one example he gives. But he, he takes a number of biblical examples, David being uh, committing adultery and murder and so on. Uh, and he says there is a process. And I'll just read you a very short extract here of what goes on. You see there is an... I'll, I'll try to put it into modern English so you can <laughs> readily understand it. You see there is an unquestionable progress from grace to sin. Now, while we're focusing on the Lord, doing all that stuff we're just talking about, the grace of God is abounding in our lives. And that grace will give us the grace to overcome temptation, grace to overcome sin, because sin is no longer our master, sin no longer has any hold over us. But there is an unquestionable progress from grace to sin. And in, in all these biblical examples he gives, it's the same sort of progression that takes place. Thus it goes on from step to step. First, the divine seed of loving, conquering faith remains in him that is born of God. He keeps himself by the grace of God and cannot commit sin. See, the scripture says he cannot sin. Not that he will not sin, but he cannot sin. Two, a temptation arises, whether from the world, the flesh, or the devil, it matters not. Thirdly, the Spirit of God gives him warning that sin is near and bids him more abundantly to watch and pray. Four, he gives way in some degree to the temptation which now begins to grow pleasing to him. Five, the Holy Spirit is grieved, his faith is weakened, and his love of God grows cold. Six, the Spirit reproves him more sharply, 
and says, this is the way, walk in it. Seven, he turns away from the painful voice of God and listens to the pleasing voice of the tempter. Eight, evil desire begins and spreads in his soul till faith and love vanish away. He is then capable of committing outward sin, the power of the Lord having departed from him. That's why you sin. That's how you sin, even though you're born of God, even though the Spirit of God is within you. So what God is doing is not just getting us on our faces, crying out to him. He wants to bring us into the life the only kind of life that can produce revival for a generation. A life that is not actually dependent upon experiences of God, even though these encounters of God are so important to get us to the place where we need to be. But a life that is dependent upon the relationship we have with God and the walk that we have together with Him throughout our daily lives. God's aim in all this is not simply for us to have great encounters with him in his holiness and even in his glory, although there will be such encounters if we are really seeking him with our whole hearts. But that our motive, our, if you like, our aim, our end point of desire is that we live the life that he's called us to live and so bear much fruit for his glory. That we not only encounter him, but we abide in him. You see, Jesus didn't say, encounter me and I will encounter you. He said, go on living in me and I will go on living in you. When I read what Wesley said, I was really struck by actually his boldness in saying the power of God has left you at that point. Because instead of depending upon the power of God, you have given way to the temptation, yielded to the temptation. Now, all of us can relate to that process. Sometimes, if it's a temptation of a certain kind, it might be a process that takes place over a period of time. And you know you may resist and you may resist and you may re- but your, your willingness and ability to resist the temptation gets weaker and weaker and weaker and finally you give in. And then you think, oh, I feel so much better now because there's no longer the conflict. But actually you've lost the battle. But uh, uh, by the same token, that whole process, those eight things that he's talking about, can happen almost within a moment of time. They can happen within seconds or, or a few minutes where that whole process is just sped up and instead of having your eyes fixed on, on God, you, you yield to the temptation and, and that whole sorry process ends up and you sin. Now, the great thing is, of course, there is restoration There is forgiveness. But of course, every time we yield to temptation in that way, we lose ground. We lose some of our ability, of our spiritual uh, ability to resist the world, the flesh, and the devil. The sad fact is, you see, that as believers... 
We have compromised in this life of the spirit and the soul. And that's why God in these last few weeks has said so much to us about having to be wholehearted in our devotion to him, wholehearted about the way we're yielded to him. That's why he said, you know, we've come, we're coming to the end of a time of compromise. Now, let's get back to this first scripture. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And, and, and God does not give birth to sinners. He gives birth to saints. So as Paul says to the Corinthians, who were getting just about everything wrong at the time, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. So what he is saying to the Corinthians, what he says, of course, in in all of his letters, is get your focus back on God. Now, God's purpose my friends, is not simply that we as a small group of people here and as, a, as the congregation in kingdom faith and even in the greater uh, family of kingdom faith should simply have a time of meeting with God, a sort of good spiritual time. God, <clears throat> God is about something far more, far reaching than that. That his purpose is to raise up in this day a holy people, not only here but all over the world, And I believe the Holy Spirit is probably doing similar things to what he's doing amongst us in groups of people all over the world. Some will be perhaps a little further on than we are, some not quite so fast. Many will be about where we are at this time. But the Holy Spirit of God is going to raise up a holy people. He's going to raise up a people of the Word. Now, people of the Word are not those that carry around a big Bible saying, I believe it. They are people that are living that word and demonstrating the life of which that word speaks. He is raising up such a people because only such a people will be able to impact the world in the way that God intends and to bring the world back to obedience to the word of God. There has got to be a people that are living in obedience to the word to actually be able to impact the world with the word. That preaching at the world, world means absolutely nothing. The world has heard the sermons, but what the world is looking for is to see the life. And it's no point in us criticizing and judging in our hearts that which is not of God, which is going on in some churches and how worldliness has been allowed, worldly values are impacting many denominations at this time. Uh, nothing, will, nothing will come of criticizing and, ha- and, and having sort of movements against this and against that and demonstrations against this and against that. Nothing of any real value happens in that way. What we have to do is to show forth Christ. Amen. God is looking for a radical people that will live the radical life of his Christian, of of, of his kingdom. That will live the radical life to which all Christians are called. Now you see, in people's thinking, that will involve completely redefining church. But it's not going to happen by somebody standing up and giving a message about how the church is to be redefined. It's only going to happen by the work of the Holy Spirit redefining what it means to be believers, what it means to be Christians, so that our lives measure up to the Word of God in the way that only His Spirit can enable by the Spirit of God enabling the grace of God to work in our lives to such effect that we live as the people that He's called us to be. Now, let's just draw this together. What kind of witness does God want you to have in your spirit? The 
the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit. I was saying, I think it was to the second years the other day, when we experienced the revival in Luton, we never had to go through anything like this because right at the beginning when people gave themselves to the Lord, they were led into this wholehearted surrender to him. They were taught even before they were born again that God would separate them from sin, not only forgive their sins, but separate them from sin so that they would no longer have to live in it. They were taken verse by verse through Romans 6 and Romans 8. Before, before they were ever led to the Lord. Some of them jumped ahead and got born again during the process, but then, you know, the Holy Spirit will not limit himself to our way of doing things. But <clears throat> by and large, you see, they, they, knew, they knew the score. They knew that it's not open your heart and ask Jesus to come in and, you know, God wants to give you a better life. You're a sinner in, in danger of hell and damnation for all eternity unless you surrender your life to God. This is the gospel. This is the, you see, there's no good news without the bad news. And if the bad news isn't preached, why should people even be interested in the good news? I mean, there's been so little preaching of the full counsel of God that today many people, even many people in the churches don't believe that the devil exists. Don't believe that there is a hell. Well, Jesus believed in the devil. Jesus believed that there is hell. Jesus spoke both of the devil and of hell. So who are we to say that uh, they don't exist? They do exist, and people are in bondage. They're in condemnation. They're living un in damnation until they get born again, until that transformation of life. Because it isn't just by you know, making some act of uh, of, of uh, raising their hand, I see that hand, you know, and say, okay, God has accepted you. You still need to be born again. You need that radical transformation of life because Jesus says you will not see the kingdom of God unless you have that radical transformation of life. Unless you become an entirely new creation where the old has gone and the new has come. So we've got to see people birth properly and You've heard me say ad infinitum that when the Spirit of God is really moving in the way that he desires, the depth of repentance that, that people have right at the beginning of their lives is so important. So, I, beloved, I mean, all that God is doing now is just confronting us with the Scriptures, with the truth, and saying, well, I've given you the Spirit, I've given you new birth, I, I've given you the inheritance that you have in Christ, you have everything going for you. Now, what I need to see is the outworking of my life in your lives. Now, there's just one more thing that... <clears throat> that God has been speaking to me about this. He says, often... We are so satisfied with the means rather than the end. Now, what I mean by that is this. We are satisfied that we have prayed. We feel good about it because we prayed. But actually, the only thing that matters is, well, what is the end result of the prayer? Because there's no satisfaction in praying unless we see the end result for which we need to believe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, we get satisfied, well, I've had my prayer time, but what is the end result of that prayer time? Have you really encountered God? Are you really fu fully surrendered to God? So you are giving yourself day by day to those means of grace whereby God working in you and through you will keep you from sin, will keep you walking in his righteousness, will keep you in his ways so that the fruit of the good tree can be produced in your life. See, Jesus didn't say by your activities you will be known, but by your fruit you will be known. What fruit comes from the activities? Mm 
Mm -hmm. And this, this is true, you know, right, right the way through every area of our lives. Even the way we relate to others, even the way in which we express the love of God to others. Do we do that because it makes us feel good that somehow we've, we've fulfilled something that we're supposed to do as Christians? Or do we have in our hearts that sincere welfare for the one to whom we are expressing the love of God? Are we, are we, are we laying down our lives for that person because we're so concerned for their welfare? Or are we doing something, you see, to satisfy a need within ourselves? A need to be wanted, a need to be appreciated, a need to be thanked, a need to be praised. Oh, thank you so much. We don't do it for that. We do that, we do it for the good of the person that we're expressing his love to. Sometimes we express his love and we get the very opposite back. But then we're not doing it just so that we get reciprocal love. That's how the heathen work, Jesus says. The pagans are like that. They love so that they get love back. But that's not what we're called to do as Christians. That's not what Jesus did. Even the pagans love those who love them. But we are called to love and to seek the welfare of any that God puts across our path. And that's the love that he has put into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that's the grace that he is prepared to see working with us to enable us to fulfill the purposes of God. Okay. Now you've had your first experience of revival preaching. Amen. This is what it's like. But not just here, wherever. You see, it's preaching stuff like this that then I would see in those times of revival that I talked to you about, hundreds of people just running forward under conviction from the Holy Spirit, falling on their faces like you have, but without all the preliminaries that we've been going through for weeks. They would just begin to cry out to God and to meet with God. I would be on my face on the platform meeting with God in His holiness. I'd just look up every now and again to see what He was doing. And people were getting born again, they were getting delivered, they were getting healed, they were getting filled with the Spirit. I mean, whatever God was doing, he was doing, but no man could dare to touch or even pray for anyone. For three years, we never prayed for a soul, because this is the way God was moving day by day by day, meeting after meeting after meeting. You see, when we're in the place with God where he wants to bring us, so much more will happen. Why? Because actually, actually, beloved, it's a salutary truth, but we reproduce ourselves in our ministries. And, you know, I know God is restoring to me this revival preaching And then he says, you see, because he always keeps you moving ahead, never lets you get too settled. He says, now, Colin, you need to see revival response to revival preaching. So that kind of response that we've seen in the past. But God is going to take us beyond anything we've known in the past. Hallelujah. Praise God. Glory. Amen. But you see, my friends, we cannot diminish the word of God. We cannot lessen the purposes of God. We cannot reduce the gospel to something that is nice and acceptable to us. We cannot reduce God to the level of our desires. And it's not going to be through striving and struggling. It's through faith. And even when we're on our faces before God, faith needs to be operating within us. That God, we believe God is working in us whatever he needs to work in us 
in order that as those that are born again, we will not sin, but we will glorify Him by obeying His commandments, by loving Him with all of our hearts, minds, soul, and strength, by loving our neighbor, every living soul on earth as He has loved us, loving one another, living in unity with our brethren. It's a scandal that there is so much division in in God's church. I don't mean division between churches, but division in churches. Because surely if there was such love, people wouldn't up and leave just because they get upset about something. That's a real sign of how the tempter has led people out of the truth of God's word into a life of disobedience. But it's not for us to judge anyone. It's for us to say, Lord, I need the witness of your spirit in my spirit that I'm in the place with you where you desire me to be. And Lord, I'll keep seeking you, crying out to you, get on my face before you, do whatever is necessary for you to bring me to that place, not in theory, but in reality. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com. 